Welcome to lecture number two. Today we're going to talk about system, system context and boundaries, as well as types of requirements. First, where do we place this lecture in the requirements engineering process figure that we outlined earlier? We're not quite in the requirements analysis yet, but it is an important precursor to what we're going to talk about in the next lecture. So it's essentially a little bit of a preparation for what comes next. What are we going to talk about in detail? First, system context, then system boundaries, then context boundaries, and last but not least, the types of requirements. So first, we're going to talk about the system context. If you look at this figure, where we have the green square in the middle representing our system that we are concerned with as part of our requirements engineering process, and we have a, another yellow square around this, which represents the system context, the context in which our system is embedded. And the third square, the outer square being the relevant environment that we don't really care about uh, when we talk about our system that we're supposed to develop. The boundary between system and system context is called the system boundary and the boundary between system context and the irrelevant environment is called the context boundary. But all of those will now explain in detail. So let's continue with the system context. So the yellow square in the middle. Why do we need a system context? Because a software system is always embedded in an environment. There is no software system that is not somehow embedded in something. Software does not exist in an empty space. And this environment influences the definition of requirements. The environment might consist of immaterial or material objects, technical or non-technical systems, people, technologies, business processes, law, sensor, and existing software components. So ignoring the environment will most likely lead to defects in the requirement specification. If you build a great system that does not adhere to its outside environment or cannot be implemented and used inside that environment, then it's useless. That's why we need a system context. Some examples for limiting factors that go in this direction could be that your developers might be only trained in Java that excludes other language options or you're having similar constraints there. Um, another system context relevant parameter could be input data that's coming from a public available database that excludes arbitrary input formats because you have to adhere to this external uh, environment parameters that you're given. Maybe extreme probing should be used, therefore you can only use technologies for which the required tooling is available, e.g. automated testing. And maybe you have to use an existing library or it has to be reused that excludes other libraries that provide similar features. Also the required uh, development is compatible with the available library or could also be like a legacy system or something else. All of those are factors of a system context. What happens if you have a wrong context? In extreme cases, your project just doesn't work at all. Critical bugs that prevent system execution could happen. The system may not be deployable. The implementation may be impossible, uh, but those are among the extreme cases. There are some less extreme cases like late changes to requirements increasing the cost uh, or the removal of features uncritical bugs are still bugs that you don't want to have and the users just don't like the software. I mean, all of those are like, it's still functional, but it's not what you're looking for as you pay for this. Uh, in general, the wrong context leads to wrong requirements. Therefore, we would like to get the context right. Uh, besides those examples and more colloquial uh, explanations of the system context. We also have a proper definition from our reference literature. The system context is the part of the system environment relevant for the definition or for defining, understanding and interpreting the system requirements. The system context consists of four context facets. First, the subject facet, the usage facet, the IT system facet and the development facet. The system context is also relevant for a second reason, because the context can serve as an origin for requirements. Without knowing the context, requirements cannot be defined properly, and otherwise the requirements may be outside of the context. 
that might become more clear if we're looking at an example from medical applications where the requirements, uh, which often require the fulfillment of medical software standards. The standards are part of the context and the standards may prohibit certain requirements that contradict the standards. It could be related to publishing patient data. The standard may also lead to requirements in order to fulfill it. For example, patient data is often somehow altered or changed in such a way that you cannot properly identify the actual person behind a pseudonym. Understanding that context is obviously important. Understanding context leads to understanding the requirements posed, imposed by the, uh, the context. So some requirements cannot be understood without the context. Example, the sending of an email must be according to RFC 821, which defines the SMTP protocol. Without knowing about RFC 821, I don't understand this part. So the context given by the RFC is relevant to get the requirements. The why of requirements often originates from the context. Example, all documents must be encrypted with AES-256. Usually this is unreasonable, but if the context is that we're talking about classified documents, then AES-256 makes a lot of more sense, especially since it's NSA approved. Defining the system and the context boundaries is one of the most important and first tasks of your requirements engineering for you as the requirements engineer. It's also your main responsibility in this early phase. Both system boundary and context boundary must be defined. The system boundary tells you which aspects belong to the system and which aspects belong to the system context. So what do you develop and what do you need to, or what essentially influences the system, like what you develop. And the context boundary then separates which aspects belong to the system context and which aspects are relevant and not in the system context, so not scope of what you should think about. Initially, it might be a little bit vague, but at some point they should become very clearly defined and there should be no vague gray zone anymore.